So, what's theology? What's theology? All right, theology. There's a difference between aqidah and kalam. Have you heard these words, aqidah? Aqidah and kalam. Yes, both mean theology. What's the difference? One's philosophical and the other is revelation and text. Kalam means Kalam means dialogue. Akida came afterwards. Yeah. Alright? Anyone else? Saad's got his hand up. Yeah, go on, Saad. Kalam Akida is, is simply stating what the field of words are. Kalam is discussing them and trying to prove trying to find about a rational basis for them. Okay, so this is the difference. Aqidah is what you believe. At most it's what you believe with the shawahid min al Quran was Sunnah, right? We believe God is one because Allah says, uh, you know, ilahukum ilahum wahid. Your Lord is one God. Alright? So we believe God is one. Because Allah says God is one. Alright? We believe that there will be a resurrection because Allah says, fihi ilallah. Because fear the day that you will be brought back to your Lord. So this is aqidah. Kalam is an attempt to establish a rational basis for those beliefs. God is one. Why is God one? How do you know God is one? You say, La ilaha illallah. How do you know God is one? Allah says in the Quran, God is one. Qul huwa Allahu ahad. Wa ilahukum ilahum wahid. This is aqidah. Kalam is this. God is defined as the necessarily perfect being. A necessarily perfect being must have power over all things. If there were two gods, if there were two gods who were both necessarily existent and both had ultimate power over all things, then... If one God willed you to stand and the other God willed you to sit, which would happen? Both gods are omnipotent. Are you standing or are you sitting? If you're standing, it means that God 1 is more powerful than God 2, which means that God 2 is not omnipotent, which means that God 2 is not God. If you're sitting, it means that God 2 is more powerful than God 1, which means that God 1 is not omnipotent, which means that God, he is not God so, God, so you've only got one God left. If you are neither standing nor sitting, which is impossible, because you're either standing or... If you lie down, if you lie down, it means that neither God has been able to achieve what they wanted, so neither of them are all-powerful, which means that neither of them are God. And if you're both standing and sitting at the same time, that's impossible. Right? Therefore, there can only be one God. That's why it's called Kalam. Because it's a lot of talking. It's a lot of talking. But kalam is an attempt to establish a rational basis. So in all that stuff that I just said to you now, which is called dalilul tamanu, right, the, the proof of mutual contradiction or the proof of mutual opposition, right? There is not one Quranic verse in there. There's not one hadith in there. You're saying the same thing, God is one, but you're establishing a completely rational basis for it. Why? You go to your neighbor and say, God is one. They say, well, how do you know? It's because the Quran says so. How do you know the Quran is true? Because God says so. Hey, eh? Well, I don't believe the Quran, so why should I believe that God is one? Now what are you going to do? Now you're stuck. But we all would agree that you can't be standing and sitting at the same time. We all would agree that if I'm, if you might, like a tug of war, and if I'm tugging this way, and you're tugging that way, and you pull me, then you're stronger than me. We can all agree on that. So it forms a, uni a basis of universal discussion. And kalam is a, is a, is a, is a you all study it as you go through, but it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very interesting science. But it entails that you know logic, please. Please understand that. There are so many people I know that have studied kalam, don't know the first thing about logic, or they've studied three textbooks in logic, but they don't know anything about logic. And it's amazing that people can study three texts in logic but not be able to formulate a logical argument other than the ones that they found in the textbook that's just astonishing but it happens okay so I get a question ah good now here we go is kalam a necessary innovation Ghazali tackles exactly that point we will get to it in its time Ghazali effectively says now kalam at, in his time and he's a student of Joani and Joani was one of the greatest theologians ever to have lived. Formal theologians we're talking about, right? Formal, 
scholars of Kalam ever to have lived? Yeah, it's Joini. Okay? And Ghazali kind of went, eh, it's all right. That was Ghazali's basic response to Kalam. And what he said is that, he said, he used an, exa- an analogy, and will, will, when we do the Book of Belief, we'll come to it, but he uses an analogy. He says, if you want to make Hajj and the road is safe, you don't need any guards. Right? There's no highway robbers, nothing like that. You don't need any guards. You just go for Hajj. Okay? It's only when the road is dangerous. It's only when there's highway robbers. When there's packs of wolves roaming around. And that sort of stuff. Now you need guards. He says the mutakellimin are security guards. Basically, they're security guards. They need to be there because the road is dangerous. The pathway to the hereafter, the Sirat al Mustaqim, is beset by highway robbers, by wolves, the Shayateen, people of Bidah, Min al Jinnati wa Nas, from among jinn and among men, trying to take you away, trying to rob you of your Iman. And so you need the Mutakallimeen not to get to Hajj, but to get to Hajj safely. The Mutakallimeen are not the guides on the path. They don't show you how to get to Hajj. They protect you while you're getting to Hajj. And this did not make him very popular. But nobody could say anything to him. Because he was the great student of Joini. Alright? So, he was dissatisfied with dialectic theology as a means of attaining truth. And we'll do this next week, inshallah. But he did see its value as a protective science. And he confronted the most dangerous heresies of his age which were the Ismaili uh, Shi'ism, the Bautiniya. He wrote five works, five full works against Bautiniya, Bautiniya. And Greek and Avicennian philosophy. Okay? But, and this is the important thing, he also, in, and this is where, this is the greatness of Ghazali. As I said last week, he didn't simply say, that's kufr, that's kufr, that's kufr. What he did is, because of his position, because of his status, because of his um, his, his towering intellect but also because of the spiritual process he had gone through and his experiential taste for God and taste of the truth he was able in all three ways emotionally intellectually and by dint of who he was to say to filter to do nakhl to sift out the things in Greek philosophy that were useful, like logic, right? Like some of the arguments, like Aristotelian arguments, but also to discard those that were problematic. And that's what he did. And his great, um, his his great um, contribution was to do this: that he incorporated some aspects of philosophy into orthodox Islam. They became part of Islam. Some of the arguments for the proofs of God, for example, right? The the, the, the rational arguments for the proofs of God are used even today. The strongest argument, modern argument, for the existence of God, which is called the modified cosmological argument, which is um, which is, uh, you know, um, uh, you know, proposed by people like William Lake Crane, who's a Christian theologian, all right, is Ghazali's argument, not even Ghazali's argument restated, just Ghazali's argument, exactly Ghazali's argument. All he's done is added more maths into it. But he simply takes, and he calls it, to be fair to him, he says this is the Kalam cosmological argument. This is the cosmological argument as adduced by the scholars of Kalam, first person to do so, Ghazali. Actually, probably wasn't even Ghazali, it was probably in its prototype, prototypic form, Ibn Sina. The philosopher. Ghazali took that and he said, that's good, actually. That's really good. I'm going to have that. Yeah? This is in sync with Revelation. And that's what he did. Ghazali was the great, he was a great filtering transmitter. He would take the truth from wherever it was. He would, he would, but he would take it all. And he'd filter it. He'd distinguish the gold from the glitter. He'd keep the gold. He would distinguish the glitter. And, and he would get rid of the 
that which was forgery. That's exactly the argument he uses, he says, in the Munqis, when he was criticized for doing this. And he says, a person who, a, a common person, who puts his hand into the bag of a counterfeiter, does not know if he is pulling out gold or he is pulling out an adulterated counterfeit coin. Okay? But the fact is, an expert in coins can distinguish between gold and counterfeit. And the fact is, there is gold in that bag. There is gold in that bag. If you are an expert, you can take the you can go to the counterfeiter's bag because you'll only pull out the gold. And you'll leave the counterfeit stuff behind. Okay? So he authored three works in theology. The greatest of them was the Iqtisad. Um, and we'll, we'll speak about more about that, inshallah, when, we do, when we're going through the Ihya. And we'll look at its place. 